What happened, Frick? Uh, huh? We are now? Yeah. Like, I'm, I can say hello to them? Yeah. Hello. Welcome, folks, to our Saturday night live in support of our Purple Heart Project, which is not that far away. Uh, the last week of April is our first class, so five weeks, six weeks, six weeks, I think. Anyway, we'll introduce everybody as time passes a little bit. So if you want to throw a question out at me, Frick, I'll take a shot at it. All right. Uh, first question comes from Dan Vasquez in Jefferson, New Jersey. Hey, Dan. He says, how long should it take to flatten the back of a chisel? Oh, that... Uh, well, yeah, that's that answer is a lot of variables. Uh, I don't know what brand. Experience is that the uh, cheaper the chisel, the less flat it is coming to you. Of course, the width is going to make a difference, as Jake mentioned. That's obvious. If your chisel has a belly in it, so take your straight edge and hold it on the back of your chisel like this. If there's a belly, meaning the bottom of the chisel is concave, convex, you don't even bother with that because there's no flat spot. You can't, every time you, in the process of trying to flatten it, it's constantly going to be moving. It's either straight or slightly concave. If it's slightly concave, you've got two resting points and you can just work them, but two resting points is gonna give you a stable platform. In other words, I would work with flat, I would work with concave, and I would not work with convex. It's just a losing proposition. How long should it take? That also depends on how far you want to take your chisel, meaning do you want to take them up to 16,000, 30,000, 8,000, 6,000? If you want to do it, if you want to do it the most efficient way, I always tell people to start with 1,000. Jake likes to start with 500. 500 or 1,000, you shouldn't have to go any... If you go any lower than that, you got bad chisels. They should come to you flat. You just Your job should only really be to remove the grinding scratches. As you get rid of the grinding scratches, it's going to allow you to get a sharper edge. Think about that microscopically. Um, Jake, give me uh, a quarter inch, start to finish. 20 minutes? Uh, at least, yeah. I'd right. say probably 25 to 30. So. Yeah. You could probably easily say 45 minutes to an hour on average for anything half inch or above. Do it once. Do it right. You never have to repeat it. So. Under an hour, we'll say, for a rounding out that answer. Next, Ken. Our next... Frick? Uh, Bob. Bob Sly in Huntsville, Texas. Hey, Bob, in Huntsville? Yep. He says, is there a rule of thumb to follow when selecting which uh, size dowel to use for wood hinge boxes? Uh, well, I don't know if there's a rule. I would suggest... If I can find one. Jake, you might need to be on the camera. I've got to walk around here. They're do, do you know where the... I don't have them here. So, quarter inch. Trying to see the little small box. Quarter inch is the smallest I go. So I would use quarter inch on anything from a little tiny ring box up to, oh, I would go quarter inch, probably, yeah, give you a length. This is just me. So if I was going to build a box up to 10 inches in length, I would use quarter inch. If I was going to build something jewelry box size, so now you're up around a foot, a foot to say... 16 inches, probably you can even go 18. I would go to 3 eighths. 
And uh, at what point would I go to a half inch? I'm going to skip the half inch for a minute and say three quarter inch I would use on furniture sides like uh, hope chest. Or if you're doing doors, vertically hung doors, half inch would be somewhere. Uh, a good example, half inch would be on a, on a uh, what do you call it, thing you put your silverware in. Silverware chest. That I would use, that I would use a half inch on. Quick, next. <clears throat> um, hey, by the way, you, you notice a nice clean shop? Kevin on tonight? <laughs> Jeff can't be. Jeff is. <clears throat> Jeff said he couldn't because he uh, didn't have internet. No, no, he's here. No. Yeah. So Jeff and Kim and Kevin and I are part of a mastermind group, and uh, our challenge is to organize our lives. And uh, in my case, this is my life. This is my office. And your surroundings dick, are a good indication of what's going on inside your head. So we're in the... Pro <laughs> is that bad news, Chris? <laughs> Moose just fainted. <laughs> Ken's ignoring me. I had, to, I had to crawl out from under Dick to get here. <laughs> so, Jake, can you, just, can you just move the camera a little bit? Don't go the back way. Just show this way. <laughs> hey, it's in stages. So I, the first thing I did was I got my my uh, my I found my tool tray and floor and floor. This I had this all cleaned up. I was working today and I just didn't get uh, time cut up on me. Found my bench, found my tool tray, and then I I went to work on this and got a lot of that straightened out. Believe it or not. I cleaned up the drill press area. I got rid of all the junk that was there. I cleaned up that corner. That was a disaster. I, so the gray area is good. That's not. That's coming next. Kim inspired us all because she, uh, she actually was the first one to start whipping her, area, her uh, shop in shape. What was the question? I didn't ask you yet. You. Oh, you know. I was off on a tangent? <clears throat> okay, uh, what is it? Speaking of organizing your life, how sharp does a chisel need to be to get a good haircut? <laughs> That's from Dave M. Dave who? Dave M. He's in the chat. <laughs> hey, Dave. Obviously not sharp enough, Dave. Probably the same it does to cut a finger. This is my <laughs> protest hair. The, answer, the explanation of that is for another time and place. But. All right, next question comes from Aaron Fenn in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Hi, Aaron. I am building a bench that is based on your design. I am not using a tool tray. How should I deal with the wood movement of the core? Thank you and Luther for all your help. So, so you're, ta you're building this bench. Okay, I, I was, while you were talking, I'm, my head was going back and forth between this bench and the Cosman workbench. Read that again, please, Frick. He doesn't want to, he's not going to have a tool tray. Yeah, I'm building a bench uh, that is based on your design. I'm not using a tool tray. How should I deal with the wood movement of the core? Okay, so I'm gonna. I, when I answer this, I want to answer so that everybody else understands exactly what we're talking about. So on this bench, this section right here, the main piece, which is 17 inches wide, is solid maple. And then I have a tool tray. And then I have my shoulder vise over here. So the ends have what are called end caps. So this end cap is 24 inches long. And this end cap is 35 and a half inches long. The problem right away is this bench is not going to get any longer, but it is going to get wider and narrower depending on the humidity in the season. This piece of wood is not going to move in conjunction in unison with this piece. This piece will move, this piece won't. I need to have this piece in order to capture the nut that holds the screw for the tail vise. I need to have an end cap down here to support this arm that holds the nut for my shoulder vise. So you have to do it. 
What I did here is I have two, two uh, nuts, two bolts that um, there's a hole bored up underneath that captures the nut right here. Same thing over there. I have about the first three inches of this glued because that way you can get that you can get away with. This bolt goes into a, uh, if it's a three inch bolt, it's in a three inch hole here and it goes through a three inch hole here. So there's no wiggle room and it's made fast with that nut. From here over is dry fit. This bolt sits in a three eighths inch hole in this piece, but the end cap has a larger diameter hole. There's two steel washers underneath the head. So that allows this to move, keeps it tight here, but allows it to move this way. Um, I have, I think three half inch splines that run this way. And those half inch splines are, are glued into this piece because the grain on the spline runs the same as the end cap. They are not glued into the uh, grooves that are cut in the end of this piece. So that means that as this grows, everything stays in line and you don't get a discrepancy right here. It's, it's flush all along there. Same thing down on this end, only on this end, I was able to glue this piece of wood right here, whether you can see it or not, this is running, this grain is running in the same direction as the end cap. So I was able to glue this piece all the way from here to here, and it's treated the same way, three splines, a, screw, a bolt here that's in a larger diameter hole that allows it to move, a bolt here that doesn't move. And again, it keeps it nice and flush. So he doesn't want to have a tool tray on there. The nice thing about my tool tray, Jake, are you ever going to pick up the camera? I pick up the camera for five minutes and then I stand here for 20. I'm trying to get the standing part out of the way. Well, how am I going to show the mess? So right here, can they even, am I in the, I'm in the, I'm in the shot? So my tool tray gets wider and narrower as this goes that way or goes that way. Now, to explain, I can't allow it to come this way. If it were to grow that way and close this gap down, this wouldn't move. So that's why it's made fast here, and all the movement has to go out in that direction. I have, I have a little ramp right here so that it makes it easier to clean dirt out like that. This grain runs the same as this but it's in an opening that's not going to be the same seasonally. So I have a little groove in the end of this ramp, and I've got a piece of mahogany that sits in there, and there's two springs in there, two springs out of a ballpoint pen, and they keep it tight, but they also allow it to move. It's actually a cool little way we did that. All right, now that I told you all that, how would I finish this off? Um... So I, I think I my first thought is you are you're just going to have to end this piece right here at the end of this. Do exactly as I did. It just ends right there, and you're just you're, you're going to have a discrepancy uh, seasonally where this is going to go out beyond the end cap, and then sometimes it's going to be on the inside of the end cap. So I would just cut this off right here, treat this the same way allowing the mo movement, you're just going to have a little discrepancy. So your joint isn't going to be flush all the time. You can't, you can't fasten anything on. You can't eliminate the tool tray and just move this in here so it finishes it off with a dovetail on the end. You can't do that because that, be, that would be trapping this and not allowing for movement. Hopefully that addresses... Put a tool tray on. It's so much better than having the stuff fall down on the floor. And in six months' time, when you clean your tool tray out, you find stuff you didn't know you owned or had forgotten about. Happens to me all the time. Next. Uh, Gil in Miami says, I'm building speaker boxes. Yeah, did you say Gil? Yep. I, in Miami, nice and warm. Yep. I'm building speaker boxes in plywood. I need to cut a 13-inch hole in the plywood panel to hold the speaker. What is the best way to cut these holes? 
Well, you're a 13 inch diameter hole, you get a really big bit. Just kidding, they don't make them. Um, jigsaw, really, is the only option. Drill a hole, drill a hole, and uh, get a, if they're going to be seen, I, I, I've never, I've, well, you could. If you get a really nice flush, a, a nice smooth cutting, finish cutting jigsaw blade, and what you can do is you can just create some kind of a compass. So I think they actually have that on the you know, little foot of your jigsaw, fasten a, fasten a piece of wood, and then you put, you put a screw right here in the middle of your 13 inch diameter, and then just, you know, you know, that's holding on to your jigsaw, and you're just going around to give you a perfect circle. Don't go too fast, jigsaws don't cut really fast. If it's going to be seen, you want to have it coming off from the saw as close to being finished cut as possible. If you do it handheld, you're not going to get it perfectly round. It's going to be a little bit of movement, and then you've got a lot of sanding to do. You could use a spoke shave, but that's the thing to do. Let me just run this by you one more time so you make sure you understand what I said. So what I would do is I would uh, get a piece of plywood, quarter-inch plywood, fasten it to the base, and then 13-inch uh, diameter? Yeah. Yep. So six and a half inches away from here, I would put a screw and just make it, make sure that you've got this square, that line, wherever that pin is, is square to the blade, and then you can just, you know, obviously got to drill a hole first, you can put your drill bit down in, or your blade down in, and then just follow that all the way around. Come up with a nice... That would, that's going to give you the most accurate and the smoothest. But don't use a used blade. Get a brand new blade, and, and you want one that the uh, the finished blades just have far less set on them, so they give you a nice a nice clean cut. How's that, Jake? Good. <laughs> Can't we still have uh, intrusion in our lives. Go for it. Um, Tyler Burke in California. Rob, what are some of your bucket Tyler? list? Tyler? Yeah. Hey, Tyler. What are some of your bucket list woodworking projects? Something you'd like to make before you pass on? A coffin. <laughs> <laughs> Am I that old? Oh, what would I like to make? Um, I would like to make, uh, I have a friend named Dave Tennant. And Dave Tennant is a uh, Dave Tennant is a really good craftsman, and he's a boat builder. But he moved from British Columbia to Nova Scotia, and now he makes some of the stuff that we sell. He makes for us. And Dave made this skiff one time, and he sent me a picture to it. And I looked at it, and I thought, if I had that, that would be in my living room with a glass top. I would never put that in the water and drag it across the beach. Oh. So I, I, um, I made a few boats in my early years. I'd like to make a nice lapstrick, beautiful skiff. That would be one. What would be another? I've always wanted to make a, I've always wanted to make a kitchen that all had wood hinge doors. These were all just dreams when I was trying to survive building furniture. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, probably the boat's the only thing that uh, I haven't taken the time to, to make. If I find something I, really interesting, I'll make it because it'll just become part of our online workshop. Commercial. So if you're looking for ongoing instruction, motivation, inspiration, we started in 2011, Jake? Was it July Frick of 2011? Yep. We started an online workshop. Uh, it's a membership site. So we filmed three 45-minute episodes um, a week. And uh, we've been doing it since 2011. So we've built lots of, lots of pieces of furniture and shop furniture and boxes and all kinds of stuff. And if you'd like to be a part of that, there's a, a yearly fee. I don't remember what it is. But 
the idea is that we keep the camera running even when we screw up and make mistakes like I just did recently. So what we're working on right now is building that tool cabinet out of walnut dovetails and through wedge tenons and the whole bit. And uh, it's really complicated. Oh, wow, it was way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. And the bench that I'm leaning on was one of our first projects. The tool cabinet behind me is a work in progress. All the cabinets in here, lots of different pieces of furniture. Clamp rack. Yeah, even the clamp rack that we did, double-sided. What was the question? Oh, yeah, so yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm really fortunate, really fortunate now that I think of it, to be able to have, take the time to build whatever I want because I can always add it to the online workshop because there's usually somebody else that wants to build something just like that. So Jake's the camera, been the cameraman. Dave Lovett was the cameraman for me for a while when Jake was away on a mission. And then Frick, you were never the cameraman, were you? Uh, yes, I was. Did, did you for, start out? For a long time, yes. For a long time? I did it most of the time Jake was gone. I thought Dave Lovett did. No. Well, Dave did half, but I, I did like the first year, I think. Yeah. So I think there's 3,000 episodes on there. So when you join, you get access to all of that back stuff. Okay, next, Frick. Uh, next one's from Todd in Queensland, Australia. Todd? <clears throat> yep. It is tomorrow morning at 25 after 7. Uh, what Good is morning. the best? What is the best way of preventing rust on tools? I have tried paste wax, but it seems a never-ending battle, particularly for tools I don't use every weekend. So I'm not sure whether you're talking hand tools or whether you're talking power tools. If it's hand tools, uh, particularly planes, the absolute best are the plane socks, just because it, they're so convenient to use and you don't have to wipe on, wipe off anything. It's a tube sock. We sell them on our website. Four different sizes for that cover the four the, all the different planes from block plane to jointer. You, it's got a drawstring on the end. It's a fabric that's silicone impregnated. You put your plane in. You take your plane out. You don't have to wipe anything off. It's just easy. I've tested them when I was on the road, and they work beautifully. We are having we are having some made that for the saws, so you'd be able to slide your saw in there, in there with all the different size saws. If uh, you're talking about power tools, um, probably the best is Bow Shield. So Bow Shield is developed either for or by Boeing out in Seattle, and it's a it's a coating that actually penetrates the metal, if I remember correctly. You spray it on your tabletop. Let it dry, buff it off. It acts as a lubricant and also as a protector for against. I've never now. I've never actually poured a, you know, a teaspoon of water on there to see what happens after the fact. But that's what it's designed for. Like you said, wh anything else you got to wipe off. So that's just a pain. But Bow Shield, it's expensive, but it's good. It comes in an aerosol can, so you just spray it on, let it dry, and then buff it off. Next, Frick. Uh, we just want to give a shout out to Mr. and Mrs. Claus. They're back with us tonight. Ah, excited. Santa Claus and his wife. Excited Howdy. to be here. Hi. They're excited to be here. It's been a while, they said. Yes. But. Nice to have you back. In case you didn't, I'll tell that story. I'll tell you that story in the middle of the, middle of the show. All right, Peter in Oceanside, California. He said, what's hey, your Peter. opinion of the Showburg Elite 2000 workbench? Is it worth $3,500 in your honest opinion? So the, did he say the Elite 2000? Yes. Okay, I've got a lot of experience with that. So I'm going to tell you exactly how, we, how I feel. When we started teaching classes, I shouldn't say when we started teaching classes. Well, yeah, when we started teaching... When we resumed. No, when we started teaching classes, or I started teaching classes, oh. I, started, I started teaching Training the Hand in 2000. I taught it in Oakville, Ontario. At, in, in the shop at Sheridan College. And then I moved it out, and we started teaching the same class at SAIT, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, out in Calgary. And uh, I would go back and forth. I would teach in one, I would teach in May in Ontario, and I would teach in July out in Calgary. And that went on for several years. I think 2011 was the last year 
I went out to Calgary. And then the kids had gotten older to the point where it was inconvenient for them to leave for the summer. We started, we resumed teaching in 2014 at Mike Smrek's farm, and we needed benches. So we bought, I had used them before at various Woodcraft stores, so we bought Elite, the uh, Schoberg Elite 2000. Uh, the 1500s a little bit too small, and the 2500, which I don't even think they make anymore, was too big. They were good benches. So what we would do is we would buy them, we would use them for the summer, and we would sell them cheap at the end of the summer so that we didn't have to deal with them during the winter before we started teaching again. One year, we ended up, we ended up not selling them, all of them, we had to store them, and the only place we had to store them was in Mike's, Mike's barn, which was unheated. When we went back the next spring to teach, oh, they were the joints had all no, it was it was dry, but it was unheated. the The bench was all wavy. The joints had all come apart. The for the most part, the benches are the are made up of smaller pieces of wood all glued together. Normally, that's okay, but all those a lot of those joints broke. It was not fun. Uh, and that's when we said, okay, we're not doing that anymore. And that's when we switched to using our benches. And our bench, our bench has progressed. Uh, when we started using ours, the only thing available to us was MDF, regular MDF. And it was okay, but if anybody put a can of pop or, or glass of water on your bench, and it was a warm day and some condensation developed, and you got a moisture ring, now you literally had a raised moisture ring, and water would literally destroy it. So we had to be super careful. Just this year, we found water resistant, almost waterproof, although you can't make a boat out of it. MDF, it's actually, made, it's actually <coughs> was made for outdoor signs. So we tested it and, it and water doesn't bother it at all. So that's, the, that's a better option. We actually make benches now and sell them as well as the plans. But you asked me about the Schoberg Elite 2000. No, I wouldn't spend that money on it because it has a great vice, but it's a solid wood top. You're going to have to reflatten it occasionally. Uh, I never really liked the base. I thought the base could have been a little beefier. Wasn't a big fan of the it's base. Three quarter material, isn't it? No, oh, it might be a little bit thicker than that, but not much. But if if you're determined to buy a bench. I would buy the show. I would buy the Elite 2000 before I would buy any 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 other commercially available bench out there that I have seen. Most of them are uh, except, yours. except ours. Yeah, but we make ours. We make ours so that the guy buying it has a flat bench and it's going to stay flat and he's never going to have to go in and flatten it. And it's it, it arrives. It's a about a 20 minute assembly. And it uses a Schoberg vise. It's good to go. We actually build the parts, assemble the bench, make sure everything fits and it works, take it apart, put it in the box, and ship it. But let not, let's not let this turn into a commercial for our bench. But Kevin, Kevin uh, Lasky, who does a lot of the... Who, who built the benches here? Just mostly Kevin? Kevin Lasky. Yeah, Kevin does a very good job. Next, Frick. Uh, Dave in Nova Scotia. Question about clamp pressure. Hey, Dave. I've been told that light pressure is adequate, but more pressure is better. What's the right amount of pressure for clamps? <coughs> well, so you see the, squeeze it. the better you get as a woodworker, you will discover the less pressure you use. Um, that goes. That speaks of your joinery. If your joints fit properly, they shouldn't require a ton. You, really, all the clamp is doing is holding the pieces together, making that glue get thin enough so it'll do its job properly. Um, if you're having to apply such pressure that you're trying to bring the two pieces together, then your joint probably suffered in the, in the craftsmanship stage. So you need to check that. If you're using too much glue, and yeah, that, another reason you have to use a lot of excess pressure. But really, well, here. You can apply a ton of pressure with these. These are uh, pony pipe clamps. And I've applied enough pressure that I've actually bent that, I don't know what it is, schedule what, Chris? 
Should I drill 40 pipe? I've yeah. bent them. Looks like 41. Check with Super Dave. He'll know. And now my favorite clamp has become this Bessie. And this is considered, do they consider these light? Or medium? Medium, I think. Yeah, I thought they were light. light. Yeah, well, yes, these would be, I use these a lot too. Yeah, so this is, this is considered a light duty clamp. This is a medium duty. I mean, it doesn't take much to bend these. And these are, these are clamps that I, I use almost exclusively. In fact, I have a hard time remembering the last time I used pipe clamps. They're mostly wall decoration. But you can use tape as a clamp too. Yeah. So you want enough pressure, J Jake said it first, you want even squeeze out. So then the question is, well, how much glue should I apply? It's like uh, the healthy way to butter your bread. How's that? You want it covered, but you don't want it thick. And when you put your two pieces together and you just get a bunch of little fine squeeze out beads, that's right on the money. If you don't get any squeeze out, well then you may not have had enough pressure, you may not have had enough glue, or you may have waited too long and it started to started to skin over. But the perfect glue joint has just a, l a really fine little beads of squeeze out all along its length. <sighs> good question. Really good question. Next, Rick. Uh, next one comes from Paul Curtis in the UK. He says, with glue joints being stronger than the wood itself, would you ever consider floating tenons over fixed tenons in table and chair making? Uh, glue joints being stronger than the wood itself, would I ever consider floating tenons over fixed tenons? <coughs> nah. I, I, you know what, there are people that swear by them, and you're right. If I, if I mortised a hole in the end of a board, two boards, and I stuck a floating tenon there that was properly glued, I guarantee it's not going to break sooner than a traditional mortise and tenon. I don't do this because I have to put two pieces of wood together. I don't do this because I have to build a piece of furniture. I do this because I enjoy doing it. I do this because I enjoy the process. This is, the making is far more, far more enjoyable than once it's made. Once it's made, I just gotta figure out where am I gonna put it. So uh, that question for me, I do it the craftsman way. If you're talking strictly time, versus strength, well then I think the floating tendon probably wins. Next, Rick. Uh, Bruce Butters in Point Claire, Quebec. How many people do we have on, Bruce? Uh, 494. Bruce How many? 494 right now. Bruce in Quebec, Point Claire? Uh, Point Claire, Quebec, yeah. Hey, Bruce. When sharpening a seven degree, 17 degree chisel, do you put a secondary bevel on it? Yeah, secondary and tertiary. So, uh, just in case you don't know what he's talking about, when I deal with really acute, pardon me, when I deal with really soft woods, meaning pine, alder, aspen, basswood, poplar, they have a tendency to crush when you're chopping in between your pins or your tails. And when they crush, big chunks of wood come out and it leaves a big hole usually really close to the surface, also almost makes it translucent when you finish the joint. What I discovered is that if you put a really acute bevel on there, 17 degrees is where I, I mean, in the process of discovering this, I would change it, try it, change it, try it, change it, try it. Well, the last time when I finally worked the way I want, meaning I got a nice clean cut without any fracturing, I measured it, it was 17 degrees, no reason to go any lower. I'm already at a point where I'm compromising the strength of the tip. When I sharpen this, I try to keep that really low. So I set it right on, on that bevel, come up just a degree or so, get a secondary by feel, you get a burr, come over to your 16,000, come up just a little bit higher, polish that off. So you've actually got same old way, three bevels, tertiary bevel, but you're, you're, you're keeping them as low as possible. No sense, no sense doing a, uh, a 17 degree primary and then ending up with a 25 degree tertiary, so. I want, uh, I want, can, can, I want to talk about the saw. I'll wait a little bit. Next question. 
Uh, yeah, Mark P in the chat. Mark P. I, I don't want to oh, even attempt his P. last name. Sorry, Mark. Uh, what are your thoughts on using kiln dried lumber versus air dried lumber in fine furniture making? Well, I actually have a lot of thoughts about that. I'll tell you a couple stories. Uh, I love kiln. I love air dried because it is. It has. What does it have? It works differently. Actually, there's several reasons. The color, air dried wood has a, a much better color, deeper, richer color, particularly walnut. It's not, uh, it, it, if you can imagine what I mean when I say work hardened, when they kiln dry it, it often does that. It changes the, it changes the structure of the wood somehow, and I can only tell that through the feel of planing it. It just doesn't have the same quality. So I prefer air dried lumber for that reason. The downside to using um, air dried lumber is I bought a, a fairly large load of white oak, cherry, and white oak, cherry, and maple, I thought it was, from uh, out west, western United States, and it was all air dried. It was beautiful wood. I shipped it home and some point in the next year or two, I discovered powder post beetles. Powder post beetles leave a little pyramid of dust underneath a little ex exit hole, which is a perfectly 16th inch diameter hole. And they are, they have quite an appetite. They destroy everything. And I had uh, pest control come twice to try to eliminate the problem. I end up having to burn all that stuff. It was the only way to get rid of it. <coughs> Kiln drying destroys that type of thing. So. If you deal with air dried lumber, then you're going to have some issues that you don't have to deal with with kiln dried lumber. So I like air dried because of how it works. I like it because of its color retention. And uh, I like kiln dried because you don't have to worry about bugs. And you know, if you've got the, we have the ability today to measure uh, moisture content quite accurately. So, I, and that's, it, it, kiln dried's only an advantage if, if it's kept in, a, in the proper environment from the time it's kiln dried to the time you get it. Where I, when I first started, moved home, you know, my main supply of hardwood lumber, have, they had a, it had a roof over it, but there, were, there were, it was a mud floor and there would be puddles in there on days that it rained. And that's where they stored their lumber. So if you didn't get there the day it arrived, two weeks later, that stuff, was back up around 12, 14% moisture content, which simply means when you bring it home, you can't go to work with it right away, which sometimes isn't a good idea anyway. Next, Rick. Yeah, Bob These Zarek. are good questions, by the way. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> uh, Bob Zarek in San Diego, California. Hey, Bob. With Baltic Zarek Birch. Zarek was married in San Diego. Oh, yeah. To my daughter. <laughs> and Megan and Jake had their anniversary yesterday. Five years? Yeah. Wow. Uh, he says, with Baltic birch hard to get or just not available, what is the next best material for the legs and frame of the Cosman workbench? So, Baltic birch, I don't know. It's, we, what's the scoop, Ken? Baltic birch. Hand him your mic, Jake, please. It's right here. Ken, to your left. Can we still get Baltic birch? Are we, as, as our supply come back? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not hard to get anymore. And the prices come down. So. Well, answer his question anyway. Well, I yeah. mean, it, it may be easier here than it is in California. Right. Well, I, I think it's, I mean, if we can get it, anybody should be able to get it. We're not the, uh, we're not too high on the list. So those supply issues, I think, have gone away. As Ken said, the prices come down, too. So we don't have a problem anymore getting it. But at the, when we did, so it was suggested to us to try apple ply. So it's apple, apple wood plywood. I think it's even more, it's more expensive. Did we ever, we never really actually get any, did we? Comes out of Oregon, doesn't it? Yeah. Was it? Out of Oregon? Yeah, it's got seeds in it though, doesn't it? <coughs> no, it's seedless. Seedless. Yeah, Honeycrisp apple trees. So that's the only other plywood that I would uh, say comes close to Baltic birch. Because all the rest of the stuff, it just has... They use such a crappy core 
uh, junk. Don't like it. Baltic birch is is three or four times better than regular plywood for that application for your bench base. Next, Rick. Carl Falk says. Carl, where? Pulis, Pul Pulaski, New York. Pulaska, yes. Well, it's all one word, so. It's no, that. What's the name? How do you pronounce that, Jake? In New York. Pulaska. Pulaska. Pulaska, yes. Pulaska. Yeah. Pulaska, New York. As fussy as Rob is, why is his workbench sharpening station still being held on by bulky clamps? <laughs> it's not. I was just looking at that. It's not, it's it's not held it's on, not by, held clamps. on by clamps. Well, what are that's, those that's Jake. No. Yeah, that no. wasn't me. That's, that was you. Yes, it was. No, it was not. Yes. That's a, rubber, that's a rubber mat. I can't see it. We were experimenting with to keep the mud off. But that, that, my... my uh, my sharpening station is held together. There's a block in here, and there's a block out there, and it's squeezed together. It's held on the same way as our workbench. Yeah, that's just that's just there holding in a rubber map that we were experimenting with to see if we can keep the <coughs> the wetness off of the bench. But I actually saw that the other day too. Actually, yesterday when I was cleaning up the uh, clamp rack, I said, "Where are all my C clamps?" I looked over here, so we will move those. Next, Fred, please. Uh, Luther just wanted to clarify something about the apple ply. He says it's a domestic birch Baltic ply made in Eugene, Oregon. It's not applewood? <coughs> apple, apple ply, he says, is a domestic birch Baltic birch ply made in Eugene, Oregon. Well, I don't Oregon. think it could be a domestic Baltic birch. So maybe he's thinking maybe the same way as Baltic birch. Just there's no voids in it. Whatever. Thank uh, you, well, thank you, Luther. Sebastian Russo. I didn't think it would be. I mean, I thought. Yeah, you don't think of applewood, apple trees as being a source of lumber. Sebastian Russo in Quebec City. Hey, Sebastian. Every time I do a tabletop. Ça va? Every time I do a tabletop, even if I take all the precautions, it wrap slash bend slash twists at some degrees. This is frustrating, and I have to constrain it flat at installation, but it's hard. Do you have any advice for reducing the deformation when I glue up the boards together? Okay. Uh, read it to me again, please. I knew that was coming. Every time I do a tabletop, even if I take all the precautions, it wrap, bends, and twists. Wraps? It, it says it wraps slash bends slash twists. Wraps, bends, twists. At okay. some degrees. This is frustrating, and I have to constrain it flat at installation, but it's hard. Do you have any advice for reducing the deformation when I glue up the boards together? Yeah. So it's never a quick fix. So the first thing you do is, uh, and I don't flip, never cut a wide board and flip the rings. That's, that's, that's out of touch, out of, out of date. But you would need to bring your lumber in. You need to uh, rough it out. So if you want an uh, inch and a quarter thick top, you want to mill it down to an inch and a half and then sticker it and let it sit, let it acclimate. Let it acclimate in your shop. Let it de-stress. Make sure you do enough boards. And uh, you know, if you're gonna have six boards, ultimately do eight so that you can discard the worst two. And I say worst two after you've prepped them and let them sit for a month or so when you come back, if you've got ones that aren't flat anymore, discard the worst two. Don't use them. Cut them up for shorter pieces. So now what you've done is you've, you're controlling the raw material itself. And if you're buying lumber that is, you know, your board's got a big old of grains twisted, well, that's going to be terrible to deal with forever. So don't use that. Try to deal with straight grain stuff. Now, that eliminates opportunity for figure, but you can do that through veneer <laughs> if you have to. But if you want a nice, straight, flat top, you got to deal with uh, well-behaved lumber. Next thing you want to make sure is that your joints, if you're having to pull your joints tight or pull your joints together with clamps because your edges aren't perfectly straight, well, that's going to be a problem as well. So you want to make sure that you, when you dry fit them, that they, they, they pull nice and tight. They're not... You squeeze this end, and this one's popping open. 
there's something wrong. You have to go in and fix that. Um, then lesser effective things would be to make sure you put a finish to all the way around, top and bottom. The wood is constantly going to be exhausting moisture or absorbing, depending on the surrounding atmosphere. So if you put a finish on the top only, then it's going to have access to exhaust or gain on the bottom side faster than the top. And when a board gains lumber, if you had a finish on the top but not on the bottom, then as it gains more in the bottom, it's going to go like this as the bottom expands faster than the top. So that's another thing to do. And then uh, the third, third or fourth, whatever number we're on, is whatever kind of framework you have underneath, you have to make sure that you've allowed for movement. So you can't constrain it. You can pull it down. You can, there's ways to keep it tight to the frame, but you cannot restrict the movement. Hopefully some of those help. Next, Frick. That was a good uh, question, by the Luther way. Very applicable. Make, Luther wanted to make something clear that apple ply is not made from apple wood at all. It's a Baltic birch copycat. It's called apple because it's American made like apple pie. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, we're clear on that. Yep. I didn't think it was apple wood, but I thought that'd be neat if it was. Scott in Georgia. Scott. He says, when would you use a chisel plane over another plane or actual chisels? When would I use a chisel plane over another plane? Or actual chisels? Well, I would never use a chisel plane when I could use any other plane. Any other plane meaning a block plane or a bench plane. Um, the advantage of a chisel plane is it has a handle and it's designed to be used flat, whereas a chisel isn't. So if, if I... If I, uh, you don't see it from where you are, but if you were to look real closely, you'd see that these dovetails have two pins, two mahogany pins going down like this to help secure them. There's two there as well. If I had to come in and flush those off, I would use a chisel because I can easily get at that. This is not preventing me from laying flat. And I would go in and I would shear that off. I wouldn't use a... Uh, router plane. All right, I wouldn't use a chisel plane there. If I'm doing a drawer, if I'm building a drawer, Jake, you know that drawer that we had here just recently? Any idea it's where always it is? around oh, here somewhere right getting there. damaged. If you move the camera around, they're going to see that I'm a uh, hypocrite. But I already qualified that. I said I got the first one quarter of the shop clean. And only quarter that will be clean. So if, if I needed to, uh, if I needed to actually- Isn't there glue in there? More in the bottom. If I had to clean this up right into the corner, for instance, if it was on the bottom side, now the drawer bottom's in the way, but the drawer bottom has to slide over the drawer back, fitting in the groove. If when I assembled it, I ended up getting, uh, this, was not, this was off a little bit to where this was actually sti up sitting in the groove, or blocking the groove, I could come in with a block plane, I can get to about here, and then I would come in with my chisel plane and I would finish the cut into the corner. So my, my block, my chisel plane doesn't get used a whole lot. But in the process of collecting tools, when you have a little bit of extra money, it's, it's not a bad investment. And I'll just give you a little, uh, I'll give you a little, um, what am I going to give them? I don't know. I'm going to tell you how to buy your, in what order to buy your planes. A little plane buying advice. Thank you, Ken. This would be number one. I don't, I, I no, I'll say first, second, and third. My first plane would be my five and a half. It gets 85, 90% of my work. My second plane would be my block plane. Interestingly enough, if you look, those are the two planes that have wood shavings in the throat. This would be number two. This would be my second purchase. My third purchase would be right here. I have no idea where it is. Jake, do you know? Oh, it's over there. It's in there. That's my three quarter shoulder plane. Let me just grab it so that you, we can make this make sense. So 
So there would be my third purchase, my three-quarter block plane. Shoulder. Shoulder plane, thank you. Um, well, if I look over here, I probably use my jointers next, either a number seven or a number eight. Uh, I would then come over here and probably, actually, I probably use my my uh, router plane. There's two of them. This is the large router plane. This is a small router plane. I would probably actually put that ahead of my jointer now that I think about it. I should be ahead of your shoulder plane. Yeah, actually, actually true too. Yeah. Okay, back up. First purchase is five and a half. Second purchase is block plane. Third purchase is a router plane. And I like the small one over the would large you? one, but either one. <coughs> Fourth purchase is shoulder plane. And it's not because I use it a lot, but be, it'll, it's the only plane that'll do certain jobs. Number five purchase would be a jointer, seven or an eight. The next one I would buy. I think leave it at five. Hmm? How far are you going to go? All right, I'll leave it at five. Don't go all night. Here you go. Next, Frick, please. Uh, oh. Another comment from Luther. Uh-oh, another apple pie? No, no, he, he uh... Shoot, where'd it go? A couple people recommended uh, as another alternative, Columbia Forest Products uh, Europly as an alternative to Baltic Birch. Uh, mm -hmm. It's available by a special order from Home Depot. Jack Lane actually said that that works well. Speaking of Jack Lane, I have a little announcement. So this is probably a good time to stop. This is going to take me five minutes, so if you want to set that up. Uh, if any of you are new... Can, can we get a, uh, can you tell us in the uh, chat, is it, we call it chat? Yep. Tell us in the chat if you're on here for the first time. That way I'm not telling people, boring people. Just give us a quick little uh, shout out that this is your first time on. We started the uh, Purple Heart Project before we actually called it the Purple Heart Project in November of 2016. And it, it was the result of Jesse Paratus, whose medals and uh, battle rattle stuff are over there. Not, it's not really battle rattle, it's patches and flag. And Jesse had contacted me by email looking for a plane, uh, pardon me, a dovetail saw. Uh, told me a little bit of a situation. He was combat wounded Marine, lived in a small pension. Just happened to say in the email that uh, ever since he got involved in hand to a woodworking, it was the first time he found any peace from the physical and the mental pain that he suffers from. Well, I have no military background. I have an uncle. I have a cousin, a third cousin, who was uh, severely injured in Iraq, but um, no personal experience. Anyway, when Jesse said that, it really resonated because I had been working with just regular folk, and I saw the difference that a week of hand tool woodworking made for them. It was a complete. It was a fantastic de-stressor. So I thought, well, maybe this is something we should do for these guys. So we tried it. So in November of 2016, Jake and I were in Niagara Falls teaching, and we brought half the class, was paying customers. The other half, which turned out to be seven, were combat wounded veterans that we had just put it out on social media that if you're a combat wounded vet, we'd like to do this for you. Let us know where you are. We covered their airfare, their hotel, their meals. We sent each guy home with four or $5,000 worth of tools. And it was fantastic. So we started our on our mission. Uh, next class was in the in the spring of 2017. We just finished our 20th class. It's uh, we now do six classes a year. We would do more, but in where we live, you can't plan anything in the winter months without severe disruption for air travel. So our next class starts in April, and we will do a class in April, May, June, July. September and October. Each class will have seven combat wounded veterans that we've selected through our process that come from all over the world. I know there's at least one coming from Australia this year. The other seven spots are open to civilians. Uh, i got to stand train of thought. Why am I telling you this? Oh, Bench Brigade. So uh, we started off uh, funding it just mostly from sales of our tools. Um, Bob Lippick, who my bench is dedicated to, was a customer friend 
that came to all our classes and uh, ended up um, dying of a heart attack just before the class in 2015. This was our regular class. When his wife found out what we were doing, she was, gave me a very generous donation and said, this is exactly what Bob would want you to do. So um, we had to fundraise because it was expensive, and people just started wanting to help, and uh, we generously accepted. Because why shouldn't you be given the opportunity to feel the same way I get to feel when I do this for these guys? You may not be able to be here to be my assistant, but you can help in other ways. Financially is the easiest way in terms of getting done what we need to get done. By the way, Luther just made me aware that um, if I'm off, I'm off by 50 or $75. In 2019, our plane tickets were averaging $500. In last year, they were averaging $1,000. And this year, they're averaging $1,500. So flights, uh, all of our expenses have gone up. Food, I know, has gone up tremendously. And we're also giving them more tools, too. So, hello, we need you. About exactly three years ago, I uh, had an epiphany one night, and that was that after bringing these guys in and teaching them and getting them excited about woodworking, sending them home with all these tools, they had no, they had no place, nothing to work on. And uh, I woke up one night realizing this, so the next day I started calling some of them, and sure enough, nobody was, a lot of them, most of them were, weren't, hadn't done any woodwork since the class because they didn't have a workbench. And that's a daunting task if you're just a week into this and you got to build a bench. Well, I knew that uh, my schedule was such that I couldn't take it on. But somehow, Jack Lane down there in Texas heard, found out about it. I must have been talking really loud. And he contacted me and said, Rob, I would love to head this up for you. So Jack took over, we, and we called it the Bench Brigade. And initially, we only needed, I think we needed 32 volunteers because we had 32 that's to get benches for past and current and uh, Jack has Jack has taken this on as a mission he uh, used to call me or email me every week thanking me for letting him do it Jim Rossetti from from New Brunswick has jumped on board and helped take care of the Canadian side of things so I'm just going to read just a little bit of information about what has happened because excuse me this is our third anniversary of the bench brigade so uh is there is it text or email text text okay jake did you already open it mm -mm. okay just bear with me i thought i had it right here in my fingertips oh yeah this is it <coughs> Okay, so let me just read through a little bit of this. Uh, Bench Brigade is three years old this month. Sorry, not this day. Rick Schmid, I'm pronouncing it properly? Schmid. Schmid in Houston was the very first volunteer, and he built a bench for Chris Kosum. Now, Chris came in back as my assistant this past summer. Uh, the first 10 volunteers meaning they've built at least one bench, and I'm going to read you the first 10 volunteers. By the way, we have built and delivered 92 benches to date. That's remarkable. And we're spinning up, spooling up. Air Force, Jack, come on. Spooling up for 2023. Okay, just let me read a note that I got. Okay, so let me just read a few things. So here are the, here are the first 10. Aaron Martin... Ahmed Ismail. Ahmed's a good friend of mine. Uh, what, what's his name? Well, what's... Amid. 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 Yeah. I have to, I have to give uh, Luther pronunciations. Andrew Hyder, Bob Scott, Carl Brink, Charlie Ray, salt of the earth, Charlie Ray. I, I wish I had a Charlie in every class. Long story there. Chris Chahusky, pronounced that right. Chris has been here to our class. Dan Poplars, uh, Danny Bell, who's he? We know Danny Bell. <laughs> yeah, ding dong, who says? <laughs> Jake was actually just with Danny on the weekend. Uh, Dr. Eric Rice and Dr. Sean Harper. Now, if I give you a few more. Uh... Uh, 
uh, jo- Josh Faust. He was volunteer number sixteen, and he built all he built all all Canadian bench class bench, and has made one hundred plus PHP plaques. Okay, I, I didn't quite understand. He was a volunteer and built an all. Oh yeah, right. So he built one of the benches. We, we had a class in twenty twenty one that was just Canadian because the border was still closed. And uh, we didn't have enough Canadian volunteers, and a group of Americans volunteered. So they made the benches, shipped them to Maine. Jake went down, and picked them up, and brought them here. And Josh was part of that. But Josh is also, Josh has been making these. So everybody, every one of these vets gets a, uh, sorry, David, going to move you over there. Can't hide Angie. So if you look at this, this is, uh, this is um, inlaid bird. Um, purple heart on maple and it has the the vet's name and that plaque goes on all their benches and he's provided over 100 of them which means there must be benches still in production because we've delivered 92 but over 100 plaques and okay that's good so big shout out to jack here's how that works by the way we have over 300 I thought I, I thought I had that information on there too. I wanted to give you that. <coughs> Ken, do you have that? The number, that the, the number of volunteers we have and the number of countries that are represented. I'm gonna. I could show a map. It's only. Um, it's only North America, but you can kind of see. Well, yeah, I know, but we're we've got volunteers in in Australia. We've got volunteers in, in various places in Europe. Yeah. I think there's six or seven countries that we have volunteers in, and there's over 300 volunteers. So the, what the volunteers do is they agree to procure the materials. We send them the vice and the bench dogs. We send them the plan, so they build it to our spec. Jack coordinates it so that at, at, at the most ideal situation, the individual builder gets to personally deliver it to the vet. And... Uh, I mean, we've got a story of one being built for a vet in Hawaii that, thanks to UPS, the bench got delivered, compliments of UPS, and the builder actually got to go over there and, and meet him, who happens to be a retired now, but he was a pilot UPS. So lots of fantastic stories. There's a, there's a, web, uh, a Facebook page called... Rob Cosman's PHP Bench Brigade, I believe. All that? Well, just look up Bench Brigade. There can't be too many of them. Yeah, Bench Brigade. And you can see videos of, we asked that everybody, we asked to spread the love, and every time one gets delivered, to have somebody please videotape it so we can actually see it firsthand. So, and we've had some celebrity builders too. I'm Behind me, you'll see a picture of David Robinson of uh, Lakers fame. <laughs> Spurs. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Spurs fame. And uh, that's David. He was here for the class. And David built Jesse Millar's bench. And that's a really interesting story because David was... Je- and now, they weren't in the same class. David was Jesse's uh, favorite basketball player growing up as a kid. And he actually arranged it so that two years in a row, he was the most improved student because the most improved student got season tickets. I think got season tickets to the Spurs game. So... After he won it the first time, he played dumb for the first half of the year so he could smarten up the second half and win it again. Something like that. But that was uh, Jack and, and, uh, and David built that bench for Jesse, and that was, uh, that was awesome. So big, huge shout-out to all the Bench Brigade. You guys, don't, you, I'm thanking you, but you don't need to be thanked because you know where the thanks comes from. And every one of them, they end up, building one bench and they want to come back and build another one because uh, if you haven't found out yet the best thing in life is when you do something for somebody else that's where the real joy comes from all right questions frick uh just just a final point jack lane says we have 350 plus volunteers eight countries u.s canada australia ireland denmark germany uk and israel those are all the countries represented yep. so uh we'll always take on more spread the love all right, next question is from Tyson Underwood in Mill Valley, California. Tyson? Yep. How do you prefer to deal with checks and splits that occur during drying? Well, 
how do I deal with them? Let's talk first about how I prevent them. Um, so what happens, in case you're unaware, is a board will lose moisture out through the end a lot faster than it will out through the face or the edge. So what typically happens is, as the moisture escapes out the end, the wood shrinks. But as you come in three or four inches, it doesn't, lo it doesn't lose it as fast. So you've got wood shrinking out here, so it's, it's shrinking faster than the inside part and end up splitting, or what we call end checks. One of the ways you can prevent that is you can just end coat the board when it's fresh. Put paint, put something on there that'll slow that drying and that'll prevent a lot of it. They do that on really expensive woods. Typically, what I do is just you automatically cut three or four inches off the end of the board to get rid of all those end checks when you're in the process of breaking down your lumber. Um, if you had a big split on an expensive piece of wood, some people are going to cut in a do a butterfly, which is another piece of wood that looks like a bow tie. And you do that, it's like two opposing dovetails to help hold that split. I, I don't do that. I, uh, um, I don't do a lot with distressed wood. That's what we would call stuff like that. But, I mean, some people do fantastic stuff with it. So proper drying would always be the best. Sticker it properly. And your stickers have to be the same thickness. And they need to be one right on top of the other so that your boards will hopefully... If you sticker them straight, chances are they're going to dry straight. But if they're under, if they're sagging in the middle, you're going to introduce, um, uh, you're going to introduce bent wood to straight wood. No sense in doing that. There. <coughs> I wanted to say uh, something else just before we we went further. So, who's on tonight? Well, first of all, I acknowledge the people that I have here. Chris came down from Fredericton. Chris Davenport. I'm going to have him talk a minute about our, our new saw that we're doing. And uh, Chris is critical to our business because of Chris, we've upped our, our saw production many times over, improved, probably improved the quality of it as many times as well. And there's ongoing projects that Jake's got him working on and, and uh, he needs to realize- I don't want him to lose his job. That I write the check, so he needs to be working on my projects. We got lots of stuff coming. It's exciting. Moose is here, the, the uh, purveyor of the dead cat sweater, which we give away every time, supports what we do, has a big display. So Moose has a, the center stall in the old city market, which is the oldest continually operating farmer's market in Canada. It's an upside down boat. You have to be there to understand. So the reason why Moose is crooked is because he stands on the side of a hill all day long like this. <laughs> So when you play hockey with him, he's always skating in the same, does the same circle. He's, like a, he's like a stock car driver on ice. <laughs> um, so Moose is here. Thank you. Ken's here. Ken manages the shop, keeps everything humming right along. You'll meet him on uh, Instagram soon. We just released uh, an Instagram last night introducing you to Rick Irvin. Rick, Rick does our chisels. Rick does uh, plane prep. He does our Kerfex 10s. What am I forgetting? Bench vice jaws. Bench vice jaws. And last week you met Ian. Ian does our saws and sometimes helps out on shooting boards. So we're doing that every, every Friday. We'll, we'll give you a, a quick little intro to somebody in the shop. Uh, somebody wants to see what's behind the 6 and 7. What's behind the 6 and 7? I think seven? he meant just be what's behind the planes. Oh. So when I, when I built this, you on your way, Moose? All right, brother, we'll see you Monday, 10.45. Try not to be late. So I'm glad you asked. When I built this saw till, it leaves <laughs> almost, plain not till. half, plain till, thank you. It leaves half the space unused. And I thought maybe I could access it from the backside here. But instead, I decided to do this. So the ones that were big enough... And I just built shelves in there, and it's a place to store blades. Junk. Junk. Stuff I don't want to see. Now, I didn't put one behind the 10 and a quarter because it was too narrow. Because you got to leave a ridge there, right? So you'd end up, really wouldn't have any time, any room to put anything. So, and I put one behind the uh, four and a half. I didn't put one behind this. 
Didn't need to. No. But that's, and this is made, this, so let me explain this since we're talking about it. Um, shortly after we finished the bench, the uh, members of the online workshop wanted the tool, tool cabinet. So we went through the entire arduous process of building a model, and then we built a full-size mock-up. So the mock-up was made out of just, used to be cheap plywood, now it's no such thing, uh, exterior grade plywood and pine. And we built it. The idea is that we would use it. And it's, it's a very, uh, you want this to really be, what, Ken, what's the word I'm looking for? Fluid? Personal. Personal, yeah. What's that word where things are... Uh, oh, bespoke. No, what's oh, the word on. that people use today? Oh. Frick. What? Come on, Look Frick. It up. Look it, it up. Look it up. What's that word people use today? <laughs> you want it to be intuitive. Intuitive. That was the word I was looking for. So... I don't know if that's a new. That's word. the worst. That's, that's pretty new. No, oh come on, Ken! <laughs> give me some. Give me some. Cut me some slack. So the idea was that we would build it, the model, the mock-up, work with it over a number of years. <laughs> we started this how long ago? 2013. 13 or 14. Yeah. <clears throat> Ten years. And it's, then it's well worked. Every once in a while, we would stop when we found a real flaw, meaning okay, this 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 doesn't flow. We would make changes. And we would go in and we would redo certain areas. And when we finally were settled and said, okay, now this works, then I broke it into six pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we would, we would go from plywood and pine to mahogany and bird's eye. So this section is done. And if you open this up, you look in and you see all of my, my drilling apparatus, although... I have two pieces of equipment. Where's my, oh, it's over there. I have two pieces. I have my egg beater drill and my brace that's out being serviced. And that's all bird's eye maple holding the pieces in. That's done. This section is, well, that's the only one. No, oh, no, this one's done. Over here, I just have uh, drawers with, with uh, they're all French fit. I've got to actually change that. You'll notice I went in and I put a face on this because this just didn't look finished. But there's all the, Jake, I want that back. Saves me hours. My goodness, I would be searching What's for this? things. Um, this one, this nice one is, neat. this is just a place for stuff. Got to have one of those. This one, the drawers were already done. And I've got two drawers left to do on this one. And then organize them. This is the one we're working on right now. So this pull out. Oh, we haven't done. We, yes, we did. My two saws, my two panel saws sit in there, and my two three quarter saws sit in here. And uh, this will have all of my stuff. So there's all of my dividers, all of my marking knives. I don't know what's in there. So I've got three, six, nine more of these to do. These are made out of sapili. Um, and, uh, of course, the theme is that the dovetail comes through on the front. The next one we'll do will probably be that section, I think. Why? I think it has to be the center. Whatever. Anyway, a lot of fun. A lot of fun to do. Love the mahogany and bird's eye look. Now, how did we get talking about that? Yeah, I really don't know. Someone asked from the chat. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah see somebody has seen in the back. Yeah. So I want to say hello to Angie. So we have a lot of people. People are always thanking me, but you don't realize that I'm just the, uh, I'm just the pretty face they put out front. I don't know what that says about you, Ken. So this is Angie. Angie is Ken's cousin, and Angie and her sister Lynn do all of the uh, packaging of our T-shirts. So as you buy T-shirts, you employ Angie, and Angie is um, due to an illness. She's been confined to her room, but she's going to get better because we already have her. Her locker's waiting for her. Her name's on it. She's got her gla her safety glasses. She has an apron. What she need? She got measuring tape. She's all set. She's all set. Yeah. She got a new phone this week, so she can see the video better. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, awesome. That's Angie. And Super Dave, Super Dave on or no. nope. 
Pardon? Oh, yeah. Okay. Super Dave's not on? No. He's oh, cracked the whip. Oh, he's getting so slack. We're going to have to renegotiate his contract. Mm. So up here in this corner, always keeping me company, looking over my shoulder, bothering me, is uh, Super Dave and uh, Super Luther. <laughs> so these are uh, brothers from different mothers. I will, I'll let you guess who is who. And a uh, big shout out to Luther, who's, who's all over apple pie. Luther, Luther and Dave uh, manage the uh, veteran side of the Purple Heart Project. So they keep in touch with them. And uh, uh, Super Dave does three months, three classes, and Luther does three classes. A lot of work. A ton of work goes into that. Now, Luther also uh, recently completed our 501c3 in the U.S., so now when you donate to the Purple Heart Project, you can receive a tax receipt for it, and um, we could use the help. In fact, I asked Luther what our balance is. Now that we have that, I'd asked him, I forgot to get the information from him. So Luther, if you hear me, tell us what we have, what we're working with. And I know that we figured it out, and it's, on last year's prices, I think we were somewhere around $320,000 roughly what it costs to uh, run the program. I wouldn't be surprised this year if it's closer to 400. Yep. You had asked a few minutes ago for, for people for the first time. You oh, yeah, to, yeah, and? So I have 14 here. Do you want me to read your name? Oh, I, I just wanted to know if, if the majority were returners. Oh, or, yeah. or 14 newbies. 14 newbies? Yeah. Well, then a lot of people had to hear a whole lot of stuff twice, but it's all right. So, am I forgetting anything? There was a bit of a b oh, debate. There was a bit of debate about what? Um, <clears throat> whether to get a seven or an eight. Well, uh, let, me, let me address that. Um, if you are a combat wounded vet that has been to our class, we love to hear that you're there. It puts a smile on my face when I get to think of your name and remember you, and we give you a shout out. So if you just text in the uh, chat, if you put at Ken, and then your name, and the class you were in, we will uh, we'll bring it up. So I'm going to address that as soon as I'm done this. So the question is, do you get a 7 or do you get an 8? So let me and give you my thoughts. And then address, if you have a 7, should you get an 8 as well? Um, no, I don't think so. The advantage of uh, the 8 is 24 inches. Hold them out. It's hard the, to see. The it. advantage of an 8 is the length. It's 24 inches long. Now, does that make a big difference? Nah, not worth going out and buying one for it. The uh, disadvantage is it's a lone wolf. It's the only plane that uses a two and five eighths inch wide blade. So everything in this plane is unique. The advantage of the number seven mm -hmm. is all of the parts on a seven, a six, a five and a half, <coughs> And a four and a half are the same. The knob, the rear tote, the lever cap, chip breaker blade, frog, everything. All those parts are the same. So why is that an advantage? Well, if you want to have a high angle blade, you can make you can have a high angle blade paired up with a with a uh, chip breaker, and you can use it in any of these planes. All all the parts are the same. So that's a big advantage. If you don't know about our adjuster just looked at that if you are over 50 and you have a bit of uh, <laughs> arthritis in your hands or you're just noticing a weakening of your hands compared to what they used to be this will this will be so welcomed so instead of trying to turn a knob that is very difficult to get a hold of this is our new adjuster it's made out of brass it has a really nice texture on there that gives it some grip and the leverage that you get with the lever aspect of it, lever, is uh, awesome, absolutely awesome. And we have them for Lee Nilsons, we have them for Wood Rivers, Lubans, and Stanleys. Uh, we are actually in the process of having them made for to fit the number fours because they were they these the ones that we use here 
are a little too large diameter. They hit the toe on the on the uh, on the rear toe to the rear handle. So we have we're making one specifically for the fours. It will fit a Lee Nelson four, but I don't think it'll fit a Wood River four and Stanley fours. No. It will fit a Stanley four. It'll fit a Stanley four, but it won't but not likely to fit a Lee Nelson number four. Okay, because they have the toe screw. No, a Lee Nelson does not have a toe screw. On well, a Stanley four. doesn't have a toe screw. No, it doesn't. But it has the toe, just the toe. I meant that forward part. That's what I was referring to. Um, so I guess this is going out to Angie, right? Yeah. So uh, Robert Freed sent me something. A while back, I apologize, my uh, timing is not always great. And this is a comfort bird. It's made out of Purple Heart. This comfort bird is made by a veteran to thank you for your service to veterans and is made of Purple Heart wood just for you. Whether you are having a good day or a bad day, there is someone thinking of you. Hold it for comfort. These birds are not for sale and handmade one at a time while thinking of the person I'm making them for. They are all they are all a little different and not perfect, so no one has to have no one will have one just like yours. And he talks about purple heart turning color. By accepting this bird, I want by accepting this bird, I want it to bring you comfort, and you are not alone, and that puts a smile on my face. So thank you for the gift for thank you for your gift to me. We may never meet, but thanks okay, because we are connected. But that's okay because we are connected. I want to thank you for being in my life and making it better. Thank you for again for your service. All of these birds are dedicated to the memory of Sergeant Christy A. Roberts. And that's from Robert Freed in Burbank, California. So Robert, I'm going to pass this on. Uh, and believe it or not, it's been on my desk all this time. And I'd sit there talking on the phone to people. And I, I, I love rubbing my thumb on there. But I, somebody I know really likes birds. And her name is Angie. And since she's such an integral part of our, our efforts, I'm going to uh, give my Purple Heart Comfort Bird to Angie, and Ken, Ken's going to deliver it tomorrow, Ken. I'm going to send it with this letter. So, Angie, this little bird is flying out to you. Enjoy it. And thank you, for Robert, for sending it to me. Next question, Frick. A tapered dovetail saw versus a regular straight saw. A tapered dovetail saw versus a regular straight saw. Uh, I have no idea. I've heard I've heard the story and I don't believe it. Personally, I think it was just a matter of being sharpened over the years. It and sharpened and eventually jointed and sharpened and jointed that it just got away from being parallel, but. I just can't buy into what I've heard, the reasoning behind it. If it works, fine. But, um, yeah. You want a good dovetail saw? You want a saw that will... That, you know, I'll take a second to tell you about that. I was talking just, with I'm, a chap today on the phone. I'm just going to read the question. I was on mute, so I don't know if they got the question. It was, it was from Rich in Manchester. He said, please explain the advantages and disadvantages of a tapered dovetail saw versus a regular straight saw. Okay, they heard my answer before they heard the question. Right. So I was talking to a customer today. I, I try to call every customer that places an order. Uh, my daughter, Annika. Annika? She calls all the customers on the second, third, fourth, fifth, hundredth order. But I call them the first order. And uh, I noticed that he had bought two things that didn't quite jive. We got talking about cutting dovetails. So the idea is you want to get to a point where you can cut this and assemble it right from the saw, meaning you don't have to go in with a chisel and fiddle about. You have to use a chisel on the bottom because you can't get a saw in there. But you, uh, you should be able to get your sides of your pins and tails cut perfectly right off of, right off of the saw. Come in, Moosey. What's on his face? This is little Moose. He is grandchild number six. Yeah. And of course, not to be one-upped, 
The latest one is on his way in. He's gained a lot in the last two weeks. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's as big as Moose. What's that, Moosey? What is that? Food? You want to say hi? No? Not in the mood? All right, let me... Uh, let me it. Let me finish this part. He's going to mow it like someone else we know. <laughs> That's his Biden haircut. So... Your saw, you have to be able to do, uh, in this chap I was speaking to, I was telling him, I said, it's easy to get frustrated when you're trying to do this because if your saw doesn't do its job, then it becomes very difficult for you because now you have to go in and literally do with a chisel what the saw should have done on its own. So there's two things about a saw that have to happen. One, you've got to be able to start it accurately. I'm being, I'm being upstaged here. What? Quick little break. So this is Royce. Royce. What's the middle name? Eric. Duh. Royce Eric uh, Cosman. Yeah. Wetmore. <laughs> <laughs> and this little guy has been uh, nursing since he was born. He doesn't get off at it very often. How much has he gained? Four pounds in a month. Four pounds in a month. Pound a week. That's like me during COVID. And um, COVID's still going on? How old is he? He's five weeks tomorrow. Five weeks tomorrow. He's, this is Frick's fifth child, fifth boy, our seventh, grand, seventh grandson. We have all grandsons, no, no granddaughters. So this is Erica's son. Frick's old for his all. Hockey team. Right? Yeah. I need four more for his all. He's pretty sure his next three are going to be all girls. It'd be hard convincing Erica, but. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye. Annika, are you coming in? So, two things your saw has to be able to do. It has you ha First and foremost, you have to be able to start it accurately. That means if it jumps a little to the left, a little to the right, now you've got to carve it all out with a chisel. You have to have 100% control over where it starts. So when I developed the saw, I put the first two inches, little tiny teeth. That's what the 22 means, 22 teeth per inch versus 15 back here. And the angle or the face of the tooth that does the cutting, instead of it being, uh, instead of it being perpendicular to the run of the blade, meaning this is an exaggeration of the tooth, the face of the tooth, these little ones up here are leaning back like that. So because they lean back, they, don't, they offer very little resistance. So it allows you to go in by pressing against your thumb and finger. It allows you to do that without any effort and just enough to catch your thumbnail. Well, what that allows for is the track for your saw to stay in, so when the big teeth engage, it cuts nice and fast. That's first and foremost. Second is, it has to cut laser straight. Straight is defined as the shortest distance between two points. It has nothing to do with angle. It's simply the shortest distance between two points. And how that translates into effective dovetails, a straight cut, produces a flat surface. So I just made a straight cut. Now I'll cut this piece off and I'll show you what I mean. Because that is smooth and straight, that means it's also flat. So when you put the two pieces back together, your glue joint, glue joint disappears. Now you can spin it around, same idea. Glue joint disappears. So now the side of your tail comes up against the side of your pin and not only do they meet nicely like that, but they provide a very good glue joint because you have appropriate contact between the surfaces. If I had to come in after cutting a joint, side of my tail, and take my chisel and try to correct what was wrong, it's almost impossible. 60% uh, of the time, the grain's gonna be running in the wrong direction. And your ability to go in and do that is just... I think the grain was just running in the wrong direction. It was. That's why I showed them. Your ability to do that is so um, advanced or requires advanced skill. Most people, the single weakest skill when they cut dovetails is their, is their chiseling. So that's not something you want to have to rely on if the saw should have been able to do it. So I'm not sure how we got there, but that's why you want my saw. Oh, they were talking about tapered dovetail saw. Oh, tapered, yeah, right. So what you're looking for in a dovetail saw is a saw that allows you to make it do what you want it to do. 
So I don't understand why a taper would uh, have any impact on that. This is Annika. Annika's our miracle child. So Annika now works here. She moved out. She lives upstairs above the shop because she never wants to get too far away from the shop. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> she cooks our lunches, and she does all the phone calling for customer. Have you done any this week? Uh-huh. On purchase number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right on up, Annika will call and say thank you. All right? Anything else to say? Hi, big hi to your customers. Um, I know a lot of our supporters are from the U.S. And we just got back from the U.S. And I left a piece of my heart there, so that I'll always have to go back. There you go. And I can't wait. A true Yankee. <laughs> Disguised as a Canadian. Get out of here. Thank you, Annika. Annika's been going to school at BYU out in Provo, Utah. She came home because she got sick, but she's in the men, so. Jake and Megan just celebrated their anniversary. Megan is an American. She's from, she's from the middle of the state of Utah, a little place called Kanash. And uh, they went down to Portland, Maine to celebrate their fifth anniversary. And they drug Annika and Chloe to babysit Moose. Next, Rick, please. Um, this has turned into a home movie. Let's see. Uh, Mahesh Chander in Georgia. Says Mahesh? How d- Mahesh, yep. Mahesh from where? Georgia? Georgia, yep. He says, how do I prevent planing tracks? When I am hand planing, I keep getting significant planing tracks on both sides. Okay. So, Mahesh, um, it's th- this one baffles me. And what baffles me is I'll be teaching the <coughs> class. And I'll go over, and a guy's got really heavy plane tracks. And I say, what's your blade doing? And they look at it and say, no, looks, looks fine. And I come over, and I see one corner of the blade sticking up. I'm going to exaggerate. A sixteenth of an inch higher than the other side. And I said, do you, do you notice this? No. Let's look real closely. Does this look higher than that one? Yeah, I guess it is. I said, okay, that means it's going to dig in more one side than the other. So first and foremost, before you go back and redo your blade, check and make sure that your blade is parallel to the sole. Now, how do you see that? Well, there's a couple things you can do to make it a little bit easier to see. You can take a Jeff O'Connor white box. This actually have a shave, has a shave brush in it. And you can set it like that. Well, now I'm, I'm looking against a nice white surface. Wipe in one direction. If you have to ask, you probably shouldn't be using a plane. Now, what I do is I look down the sole, but I tip it a little bit. And by tipping it a little bit, I can see the throat. And as I use my adjust star to advance the blade so easily, I now see the blade. The blade looks like a really thin black line. And what I want to do is determine, is that line, is that little thin blade projecting the same across the width of the sole? If it's higher on one side than the other, then I use the lateral adjustment lever. That's this piece underneath the blade. And if the right side was sticking higher than the left, I would pull the adjust the uh, lateral adjustment lever toward the right side. And it would pivot. It, it would cause the other side to go up higher and this one to go down. And I would do that until it looked like it was correct. Then I would use my adjust star to lower or pull the blade back in. And as it gets really close to disappearing, I can still see it on the left side, but I can't see it on the right side. So I know I've got to make another little fine adjustment. So I'll go in and do that. And then I'll pull the blade all the way in. Now, to make this easier, and this is a little bit time consuming because you've got another, it adds another operation to the process, but it's advantageous. Get a piece of wood that is close to the uh, width, close to the width of the blade, and start planing. Shoot, I'm saying shoot because I want a board that uh, already has a flat surface to make this easier to do. So while I'm planing, well, first I need to put, this is really going overboard. I need to get some Rob Cosman Magic Plane Wax. We don't do commercials. 
to lubricate that sole. As I plane, I start turning my adjuster, watching to see where the first bit of shaving appears. Aha, see that? It's on the right side, none on the left. Do it again. I moved the... Uh... Now, I actually, I moved it instinctively without, I meant to do it slower and tell you what I was doing, but I moved the adjuster, I moved the lateral adjustment lever, and now when my shaving comes out, it looks to be pretty even. If I were to unravel that, And it's pretty straight. It's not curling off to one side or the other. If it was, then I would think whatever side it curls to is the thin side. The thick side is curling away from, and I'd have to go and make that adjustment. But now that it appears to be parallel to the sole, now I would go back to planing the wide surface, and I should be able to control my plane tracks. Now, if in the process of doing it, I still can't get them, then I'm going to go in and I'm going to check my blade. And what I'll do is take my plane blade. What's up, Moosey? Take my plane blade and very carefully get something that's flat and up against the light. Set that on there. I don't like doing that. And I shouldn't see light in the middle. I should see a little bit of light on either end. And if I do, then it's okay. If I don't, I've got to go back and correct it. When I sharpen my blade, when I go in and sharpen my blade, starting on my core stone, dangerous kid, find my primary bevel, Raise up a little bit. I'm just I'm distributing the pressure evenly, uniformly with all four fingers. And that's one thing you have to be able to you have to be able to think through your fingers almost. Light to moderate pressure. And I'll do that for about 10 seconds until I can detect a slight burr on the back side of the blade. Now I want to verify that the burr can be felt from side to side. Um, it's going to be problematic if you put too much downward pressure. You have to have light to moderate. Once I've got the burr, I'm going to come over here to this stone. This is my finishing stone. Find the same primary, raise up just a little bit higher, and repeat the process, creating what we call a third bevel or a tertiary bevel. And after 10 seconds of doing that, moving slightly so as not to wear one spot prematurely, at the end of the 10 seconds, without changing anything, I'm going to put extra pressure on my right index finger for three seconds. Then I'm going to switch and put extra pressure on my left pinky for three seconds. So what I did is I pushed down a little harder here, and then I pushed down a little harder there. And that'll create a slight feathering of the outside corners. And that will pull those corners in on that finishing pass where it's really light and that will allow a blending of the passes so that you don't have any demarcation. You can't tell where one stopped and one overlapped. <clears throat> Next question. Um, Frick? Yep. Ian Atkinson in Ancaster, Ontario says... Ian? Yep. If I spent $1,500 to $2,000 on your tools, what would you recommend to start with? With no build or... Would you start with start off with to build a great tool collection? Um, are you starting from scratch? Sounds yeah, like assume it. that. Well, how much to how much? $1,500? 15 to $2,000. 15 to 2000 I'm going to go with two <laughs> because... The most important thing you have to have, there he's driving, is your stones. You cannot scrimp here. This, this determines how well all of these are going to work. And uh, although it's a chicken and an egg, I'm going to say that this is the chicken. Got to have the chicken before you get the egg. So you get your stones, and you get exactly what I recommend, which is you either go with all Shapton, 
which is going to be a little more expensive, where you start with our, our diamond plate and your 16,000 on a heavy holder. That's going to, if you go the, if you go the, uh, minimalist. the minimalist route, you're <clears throat> about 500. Call it. American? Yeah. Let's stick with American. Assume. Okay, about 500. There. Oh, he is in Ontario. So. He's in Ontario. Oh. Okay, well, I'm nice. Uh, Go with fifteen hundred yeah. US then. Okay, so you're going to spend a hundred. You're going to spend five hundred right there. But that's going to give you five to five to eight years of u- of use before something wears out. Then you're going to get yourself a, a five and a half, and you're going to get one from us. And uh, Rick is going to do it up for you. He'll make sure he will flatten the sole, square the side. Clean out the mouth, take care of the edge, sharp corners, prepare your chip breaker, prepare your blade, sharpen it, prepare the underside of your lever cap, and he will have it so it'll be pulling off those kind of shavings before we send it to you, and he'll put one in your box with it. So that's going to get your planing. I'm going to suggest that you go in and you get three chisels. Get a quarter, a half, and either a three-quarter or one inch. And... Well, hang on a second. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you're going. How much have you spent, Ken? So he's at eight fifty for the stones and the plane. And each chisel's one one twenty. Okay. So that's gonna allow you to go back in and pick up a six thousand grit stone, because in doing the backs of your chisels, you can't go from one thousand to sixteen. You gotta put an in, in between step. So that so you might as well get the apprentice kit. The apprentice kit includes the six thousand. You got your three chisels. You got your plane. And uh, I mean, you, yeah, you just asked me to get you started. I would say pick up a marking gauge. Get one of our marking gauges. You never uh, even mentioned a saw. Well, I know, but because he, he can't, he can't get what he needs to dovetail with that amount of money. You could get a dovetail saw, but that's going to put you over, and you're going to be spending your wife's inheritance. Yeah. So stones, plain chisels, and then move on to your gate, your saws, your gauges, all your dovetailing tools. In reality, oh, let me let me explain what we're going to do. By the way, so you see this tool cabinet? This is the prototype. We got to give away one of Jesse's. Thing. Where are we with donations? I forgot. I forgot to mention. Uh, as you donate, we give away a prize for at thousand dollar increments. So, and those prizes are stuff that we buy from uh, the vets that I work with: Kevin Burris, Jeff O'Connor, Kim O'Connor, and uh, not only does it help them in their business, but it also gives you some really nice, really good stuff. So back over here. So this tool cabinet, this is a prototype. And now it's being made in walnut. So these, here's, there's the, and it, it, like I said, it is a complicated piece. I'll just show you one, pe- one side piece. So there's a side piece, dovetailed at the top, dovetailed on the bottom section, through wedge tenons, holding these two pieces in. Then your drawers will be in here. Once it's completed, we're going to have a special night when you guys can all contribute to filling it full of tools. Somebody wants to donate the cost of a dovetail saw, somebody else can do all the different pieces. When it's full, then we're gonna raffle it off. Less is all Luther's problem to figure that out. We're gonna raffle it off, and some lucky person is going to get that full of tools. And all of those proceeds are going to go to our PHP. Uh, I suspect it will be worth somewhere north of $10,000. So that should get you excited. Coming in to say hi, Chloe? Make the home movie complete? No. CEO status? <clears throat> What's the CEO stand for? She's the youngest. She thinks she's inheriting everything. She's going to be the CEO. I said, well, that means that stands for clean elderly often. Now she wants to be the CFO. I don't know what that stands for. Okay, next, Frick. Where are we at donations wise? Uh, oh, you got you, you got them? I, no, I don't know. Okay, Ken, any vets? Yes. Okay, please, let's have it. 
Who are we saying hello to? Well, they don't, they don't, I don't always know if they're vets or just people who have been in the classes. Because sometimes when you ask for vets, people who have been in the classes uh, respond. But, okay. Uh, Jimmy. Sinowski? Yeah, Sinowski. 2020. Uh, Christian Halwig. October 23. Chris, Christian is, it was, a, is a vet. Ray Dorr. Jimmy? I don't think so. Ray, Ray Dorr. Ray Dorr. Cool Ray. Ray. Cool Walter Ray, Vietnam. Uh, Walter Rao. Walter, Wally's up in Ontario, <laughs> Canadian vet. Also, uh, Sacrifice Medal recipient. Sacrifice Medal is the uh, Canadian version of Purple Heart. Big shout out to you guys. Anybody else? Uh, <clears throat> Kevin no, on? So far, that's it. But, well, I uh, saw, I saw um, Big Ralph. Jeff Ralph O'Connor's Sutton. on. Ralph's on? Ralph, Ralph Sutton? Yeah. Howdy, Ralph. Uh, you asked Luther earlier about the donations to date. Yeah. 82,000 since December of 22. Wow, 82,000. That's, that's, that's incredible. $82,000 has been donated since December. A lot of that has been corporate donations. And we so, have uh, 1,600 so far this evening. 1,600 this evening? Did you, did you see Santa Claus's donation there, Kirk? Uh, I saw that. I, I don't know if he's made it yet. I'm just going okay. by what Luther's telling me. Oh, he just he just put in the chat another thousand to our three thousand, so that would be four thousand. So we're we're at four thousand. Well, Santa Claus donated four. So. Donated four thousand. Mm. Well, thank you, Santa. So four thousand added to the sixteen. Mm. No, no, four thousand added to the sixteen. Yeah, to the sixteen hundred. Yeah. So we're at fifty six. Mm. Right. Mm. Okay. Thank you, people. Yeah, you know what? Live by this. Freely give, graciously receive. Let me explain that. Um, Bob Proctor once said that uh, if you have something that you won't loan, it's time to give it away. No material item should ever mean so much to you that, that you're not willing to part with it. And uh, on, a, on the flip side of that is when some little old lady offers, you to, give, uh, offers to bring you cookies, say yes. Say yes. Freely give, graciously receive. When I have to teach that to the vets when they come. We're giving them all these tools. And why me? I said, just accept it. Accept it so that you can make somebody else feel good about having been able to give away, give something to you. Tough lesson. So these guys are all givers. They, they're not typically accustomed to being receivers, but we retrain them here. <clears throat> I was recently accused of bringing vets in here and brainwashing them. <laughs> but you know what? Your hands get dirty. What do you do? You wash them. Your brain gets dirty. Come here. We wash it. What are you going to say, Ken? Michael Delvoy from August 22. Mike? <coughs> Howdy, Mike. Anyone else? You just showed it out if you would. Frick, question? Uh, we got to give Chris a job. Okay, last one. Derek. He hasn't had a job since that big tool giveaway for uh, Sean. Yeah, we worked him too hard that night. Yes, Frick? Uh, Derek in Mapleton, Georgia. Hey, Derek. Says, I've watched prior videos where you discussed drill press runout, but what are your top suggestions on how to minimize or correct the amount of runout on a drill press? Well, <laughs> a lot of that is just built... In, what? I, did you say something, Frick? No. Nope. Oh. Okay. A lot of that is simply built into the machine, meaning the quality's not there. Um, on my general, there's two places here that I can tighten up where the sleeve, the, the quill runs down through. This one and this one. And that can remove a lot of it. But I haven't seen that on every drill press. So... When your drill press is all the way down, if you can take that and shake it substantially, there's nothing you can do about it because that's just the way your machine was made. If you're buying drill presses for $400, you can't expect them to perform like they, the ones that cost $2,500 or more. And that's just a, uh, that's the unfortunate side of it. And people say, well, I don't need it to be that accurate. Well, you know what? You want your holes to be exact. You can't have drills that, that the, the, it's bad enough that the drill will flex somewhat, but when your quill will move, 
well, you're kind of asking for trouble. Next, Frick? No, wrap it up. You're such a party pooper. It didn't take Everybody you so long knows to wrap that. It up. You're the party pooper. You always shut us down early. Yeah. How many prizes are we giving away? Well, if we count uh, Santa Claus's donations, which Four. we do. Five. 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 Yeah. Okay. And we have. Uh, just give me a second here. We have a new item from Snippet and Stitches that we could give away tonight. What's that? Uh, <coughs> Ask Jeff if we have a cleaver ready to give away. He makes a cleaver, a Damascus, Damascus steel cleaver. Give me one second. I, she sent me, a, or Jeff sent me a picture of it. I'll get it on the screen here. Oh well, you're doing that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna gather up, gather up some of the uh, prizes. All right, so here it is. It's the... Luther's been bugging me to send him this. <laughs> this is the new limited edition Welcome to My Shop Rob Cosman hoodie. Oh, right. Featuring your flowing locks, or whatever <laughs> you want to call them, and the, the, the logo. Available in many, many, many different colors. So that's available on uh, Snippets and Stitches. That's Kim O'Connor's website. And I will post the link in the chat. But we're going to give one of those away tonight. Jeff said he had a cleaver ready to go. He does have a cleaver? Good. Good, good, good. Okay. Let's give away uh, three dead cats. Let's give away one of Jesse's, one of Jesse's um, cell phone holders. Well, I got one already wrapped up. I'm not going to unwrap it. I'll just put it right here. So Jesse Rufiang is a combat wounded vet that came to our class. He was one of the first, one of our first two Canadians we had. He and Kyle Perrall out of Newfoundland. Jesse was in Alberta at the time. He'd since retired. Now he lives in Nova Scotia, and he actually makes some stuff for us. Jesse, Jesse is an exceptional craftsman. His work is among is among the best I have seen. Very precise. Um, so he does these little cell phone stands. You can set your, and um, you just look at it and you'll see, it's all finished finished off right off of the plane. So you can either put your cell phone like that, or if you're watching a movie with your wife in, in uh, portrait, no, that's not portrait, that's landscape. You can put it like that. All right, we're all ready? Right. Okay, so let's give away three dead cats. Where are they going? All right, let's see. Okay, draw number one. <coughs> First dead cat oh. is going to Glenn B. in Darlington, UK. Hey, Glenn, you're getting a dead cat in the UK. You will always want a dead cat in UK. Number two. Let us know what size you want. You're going to Jim Robinson in Elgin, Ontario. Jim in Elgin, you'll definitely need a dead cat. Let us know what size you want. And number three is going to Rob Biedenharn in Ohio. Rob, Ohio, yeah, yep. yep, need a dead cat there as well. Good. Hey, uh, Jake, uh, did you see Rick Elder on tonight? I did. Okay, I'll save. I've got one of his things to give away too. Okay, now let's give away. Uh, <coughs> let's give away Jesse's cell phone stand. Who's that going to? That is going to Mike in Toronto. Mike, congratulations. Contact us so we can get your address. Okay, so for the uh, five, five or four? Five. Five big prizes. Um, we're going to choose from uh, one of Kim's creations. So Kim, now you guys need to be nice to your wife. Kim, her company is called Snippets and Stitches, and Kim makes custom handbags. So she makes these. Entirely, you can. You, if you go on her on her uh, Instagram channel, you'll see Instagram or YouTube. Now, I don't know anything about handbags, but I know quality when I see it. Things are nice and even and just well stitched. All things you'd expect. Luther knows a lot more about handbags than I do. I should have him up here telling it. But you see the little snippets and stitches logo that right there. 
I, I had asked her to make me a patriotic one, so she will custom design them, and she does lots of different ones. So what we're going to do, well, we're giving away five, so we're going to start with Kevin, because we did a, we did a, an O'Connor one last time. And, and uh, so Kev does these laser engraved plaques. I like to call them carved in stone. You can either get them in granite, or you can get them in, uh, in slate. I like to slate myself because of the texture and the unevenness of the surface. He just did a couple the other day for a couple of businesses. We have our mission statement on our, in our wall at, near the front entrance in the main shop. We also have our Purple Heart one right here. And I've got one up in my office that says uh, success is the su success is progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And I've got a couple of others around here as well. So let's give away one of Kevin's plaques first. He'll do whatever you want for him, whether it's a, uh, a picture of your favorite dog or whether it's a military theme. Who are we going to give it to? Uh, let's see. It is going to... How many people do we have on? 562 right now. Carl uh, in Silverance, Texas. Carl, congratulations. Either his name is Carl yeah. Silverance or Silverance is the city, but it's Carl in Texas. All right. We had a little mix-up last time. Somebody registered with their first name only, but we did have their email, and it wasn't the person that thought it was. Anyway, apologize. Okay, Carl, let us know what you want. We'll actually put you directly in touch with Kev. Now, let's give away one of Kim's bags. Okay, it's going to Gene Dixon in South Carolina. Hey, Gene, and if that's a problem for you, meaning you don't have a female in your life, we can make, arra we can, uh, we can make arrangements within the family of the O'Connors. Okay, now let's give away one of Jeff's. So Jeff has a new cleaver, Damascus steel cleaver. I'm going to show you. This is his, um, uh, what's this called? It's for uh, oyster shucking. So there's, this is the Damascus steel, and this has a bog oak handle. That's Jeff's, that's Jeff's um, lay, uh, uh, medallion on there. Jeff is a Navy EOD, retired. But he does a cleaver. I really like it because I know there's one on its way for me. So let's give away one of Jeff's cleavers. Who's it going to? It is going to... Ron Horrell in Connecticut. Hey, Ron. Congratulations. Hello. So number four is back to one of, one of Kev's plaques. Who's it going to? Remember, he'll do. He'll customize it for you. Uh, it is going to Christopher Bryant in Indiana. Christopher, congratulations. Now he'll either he'll either provide you with uh, um, uh, what do we call these stands. Or he'll drill it out and send you the hardware to mount it. And uh, the last one, prize number five, it's going to be a uh, O'Connor. Got to be fair. So Is you're going to have your choice of either one of Jeff's knives, a shave brush, or one of Kim's handbags. Your call. I thought we were doing the hoodie. No, that's the purchase. Because I think she's doing that as a fundraiser for... Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, all the for proceeds PHP. of that go to the PHP. Yeah, so. yeah. They're really nice hoodies, too. I saw her with one on the other day, turquoise. All right, last prize is going to Stephen Vasquez in New Jersey. Steve in New Jersey? Yep. Congratulations, Steve. You'll, uh, you'll either be dangerous with that cleaver or your wife will be happy with that bag. Is that it? That's it. Okay, thank you, folks. We appreciate your support. Uh, remember, our class starts April 20, what? 3rd or 4th. 23rd or 4th, the last full week of April. Um, we're getting really close. We've got to pull the show. We've got to pull everything together. I, uh, I was gonna well, sometime this week, we'll, give you a, we'll do a little video of the rooms that we're building out at the front so the vets can actually stay right on the premises. Won't have to transport them back and forth. They'll be right here. It's going to be awesome. We're going to follow that on Instagram too. So make sure yeah. you, follow, you follow. And Anita, there. Anita, our chef girl RD has been trying out new recipes. We're we're the uh, wonderful recipient. Jake, by the way, there's those things for you. And yeah, food is fantastic. I I hate to tell you this because there's no spots available, but I'm trying to talk them into releasing the dates for 2024. 
So people that are waiting can secure it now. More on that later. Oh, wait, check. Where's, where's, where's the saw? Where's the saw, Jake? Got to show you our, our hand saw. We're that much closer to having it ready. So here's, uh, I got to get up close. So we're working on the, uh, on the logo. And can you tell me if you can see it? Yep. Chris is working on that. We're tweaking it a little bit more. Uh, that's the handle. This is the one we torture test. We dropped it 20 times. Actually, I already showed you that. The only thing that didn't broke the horns. It's got really nice balance. Chris will have the uh, Chris will have the logo solved before we film again. And then you guys were about two months out. I hope I can hold you to that. We're actually going to allow you to pre-order them. I got to get back to Luther on that. So really soon you'll be able to actually buy them before they're ready so that you can get them because I think they may go quick. All right, listen, have a wonderful two weeks. We'll see you back here two weeks from tonight on a Saturday. And uh, please spread the word what the Purple Heart Project is so that the right people who need it will find us and we can be able to help them. Thank you.